second review of labor legislation in South Africa in over 40 years is underway. And according to AdCorp, with the new labor legislation coming soon, what matters now is how businesses interpret as well as manage it. Joining us now to explain more on labor relations uh, is labor relations consultant, rather, your John Boerta. John, looking at the new uh, labor relations uh, coming into the SA market, just exactly how big is the impact that it could have not only on businesses, but economically? The impact on business is really significant. You know, as you indicated, it's the largest labor law review that's taken place in decades. The reality is that the nature and extent of those changes uh, single-handedly has the potential of bringing many businesses to their knees if they don't respond appropriately to that. How exactly will that happen? Because the discussion has been going on for so long, it's almost like it's become part of the furniture. Now people have to actually look at the impact. Yes. Well, the discussions moved from the platform into the boardroom, really. And I think for the first time, organizations have started to get their mind around provisions such as equal pay for work of equal value. Um, the reality that fixed term contractors in future would have to effectively be treated equally to their permanent counterparts. So if two individuals doing effectively the job of same value would now have to be treated equitably. Does it, would that include things like... Uh, cost to company, so where the yeah. full-time employee has uh, medical aid, pension deduction and so on, would the casual worker have to get the equivalent of that? Yes, after, after a three-month period of being a casual worker, or we call it a fixed-term contractor, the terminology is that they should be on the whole treated not less favourably. So they wouldn't have to be on the same medical aid or exactly the same pension fund, but over, you know, overall they shouldn't be any worse off. But obviously there are conditions attached to that, you know, conditions such as the quality and the quantity of their work, so performance related remuneration has got a big role to play, and the normal things that differentiate, such as experience, length of service and merit. So the concern that we have is that many organisations don't understand how to strategically um, analyse their, their position in the context of these labour laws, and, and certainly a number of organisations we've engaged with could face closure if they had to equalise salaries in the, in the short term. Um, without innovative solutions around that. And that's really what we're into at the moment, is to try and place organisations uh, in the best way possible. You mentioned innovative solutions there. What kind of innovative solutions might be able to assist them in not falling to their knees, as you stated earlier? Well, I think the, f the starting point is not to just focus on labour law. I think that's a mistake that so many individuals make, because the amendments that we're talking about are under the Labour Relations Act. And the LRA is firstly one of, of a whole range of labour laws. Um, so organisations need to interpret the, the, the changes to the LRA in the context of overall labour law. But more importantly is triple B double E. You know, if we talk about labour brokers, mm -hmm. um, some organisations that are being incorrectly advised may be looking at, at cutting down the use of labour brokers, but that has a significant impact on their BE scorecards, for example. Mm -hmm. so, so the procurement that they used to gain by engaging and transacting with labour brokers um, if they want to take those flexible workers internally, their payroll you know, grows in size and quantum, and anything that's a percentage of payroll means that the costs, the on costs to organisations are huge. You've said, John, there are a couple of myths around this as well. I mean, some of it sounds quite disturbing, but uh, we must uh, get it to what it actually is going to do as opposed to what everyone thinks it might do. What are one or two of those myths that people need to have exploded? Yeah. Well, I think the biggest myth that concerns me specifically is, is this myth that labour brokers will not be around after three months. So they're temporary workers that they place with organisations. Many people have interpreted that after three months the client becomes a permanent employer. And nothing could be further from the truth. You know, their co-employment relationship continues indefinitely. Another myth, for example, would be that fixed term contracts can be for no longer than three months and then people become permanent. Absolutely not the case. Mm. You know. Because provision in the Labor Relations Act, for example, has been made for fixed-term contractors that are beyond 24 months, and they will now be entitled to termination pay. So the Act is actually very clear mm. in saying that you could have fixed-term contractors indefinitely, five, six years potentially, but what you have to do is treat them fairly. Yeah, John, I, I think the other thing is that... Uh, and it's the law of unintended consequences. You're Correct. a lawyer and I think it's the most powerful law that there is and uh, most people don't know it exists because they only realise it, its effects when these happen. What are some of the unintended consequences? You mentioned uh, people not perhaps hiring as many people. Uh, are there things that are going to happen which the framers of the law and indeed the businesses that have to operate them, have to submit to them, haven't thought of yet? 
Yeah, well, I think the unintended consequence is that organizations are driven largely by the BE credentials. So I think on the contrary, rather than eradicating or, or decreasing labor brokers and outsourcing, it's going to drive outsourcing because organizations on the new BE scorecard are much heavily weighted on procurement rather than employment related uh, credentials. Mm. So I think companies are going to look at outsourcing more, they're going to use labor brokers more, but the difference is they'll have to partner with, with labor brokers that have got good technology, good balance sheets that are very strong so that they can withstand potential litigation. So doesn't that bring in the question as to how we regulate the labor brokers? Because you mentioned there are some good failures in the industry, but uh, there are also some of the rotten types. So how do you yeah. find a common balance between As in two? every family, you have the good, the bad, and the ugly. <laughs> uh, so so uh, government have catered for that. They, one of the four bills that will be promulgated next year is the Employment Services Bill, and that will um, heighten the registration and operating requirements for labor brokers. So they're going to be under a lot more scrutiny um, we've seen it in the EU. Equal pay for work of equal value and co-employment has been in the EU for decades. Um, the consequence, unfortunately, has it been that your smaller labor brokers have fallen off the bus because their technology, mm. their management information, their balance sheets are not strong enough to withstand potential litigious issues. What's the effect going to be on a place like uh, Madupi? Uh, where you have, I mean, the construction industry, almost by definition, they have to use casual workers Correct. because they go through such large cycles. Yeah. Look, I think the, the impact there is that management have to stand strong. You know, clearly, uh, trade unions are going to use these laws, um, and especially if people are not informed, uh, trade union ideologies will, will maybe shake the knees of managers. So managers have to stand strong, they withstand the initial drive-by unions uh, in pressurizing for permanent employment, because the reality is you need fixed-term contractors on those projects. And I think managers just need to, to see that initial pressure through. Um, and, and effectively understand their rights under the law.